session is basically a review session for your exam over the second unit of this class. And uh, in your materials packet, you should find a chart that uh, has down one side uh, the names of the religions and then some aspects of each religion across the top. Looks a lot like this that you can see on the screen right now. And um, so what I'll do is work through uh, helping you fill this chart out in this session. When I think about uh, the material for this unit and your preparation for the exam over this unit, I think about this chart as maybe like a skeleton, uh, the bone structure of what you need to study. And so if I were studying for this exam, probably what I would do is learn the material on this chart, make sure that you know what the terms mean that are on the chart, not just know what terms go on it, and then go back and review your class notes. A lot of what's in your class notes will be here, but your class notes will put a little more meat on the skeleton for you. Uh, then go back and review uh, your terms list, and that will add other terms that maybe aren't covered on this. Uh, review what you've been asked to know from the readings assigned during this unit. And then finally, you should also have study guides or the films that you've watched in this unit, and so you'll need to review those study guides. So you have a lot of material to review, but I believe if you start with this chart, you're going to be way down the line as far as what you need to know, and then you can just fill in with the other material that you study. So let's go through and uh, fill out this chart that you can use then as you prepare for the exam. We'll start out with uh, Hinduism. Now, uh, also let me make note that what's not on here is the animistic religions because they don't really fit neatly with these categories that's on this chart. So don't forget that that's part of this unit is also the material on the animistic religions. Uh, but this chart has the five major world religions because they fit more in this paradigm. So first of all, as far as Hinduism, as far as when Hinduism began, there's probably a couple things to remember there. Uh, first of all, that with, within Hindu philosophy, what the answer to that question of when Hinduism began would be that it has no beginning, as you may remember. Um, the idea in Hindu philosophy is that Hinduism has always been. Um, it's, it's an eternal philosophy. It's an eternal way of life. So at one level, within Hindu philosophy, Hinduism has no beginning. Uh, as far as putting it into history, what uh, I talked with you about and what your textbook talks about is that it was probably uh, sometime pre-18th century BCE that Hinduism began. But we don't know how long before that. We do know that by the 18th century BCE, there was a group of people, which you might want to put under founder, the Aryans, that had a body of uh, religious spiritual teaching that was like an early form of what we would call Hinduism today. So uh, we know it was around by the 18th century BCE. Uh, again, as far as the founder, we don't know who the founder of uh, Hinduism was. The earliest known followers of Hinduism were the Aryan, what was the Ar Aryan civilization that we talked about that migrated into northern India in the 18th century BCE. As far as sacred text in Hinduism, there is not a, a Hindu Bible, there's not a universal text around which all of Hinduism is centered. You would find uh, some Hindus that would have no sacred text, and you would find a lot of Hindus that would consider various texts as sacred. But probably, uh, certainly, I think we could say the three most popular texts are three that um, I talked with you about in class and that your text also talks about, uh, the Vedas, the Upanishads, and the Bhagavad Gita. And make sure you review those a little bit. You know, probably what's significant about the Vedas is that they are the oldest of the text. Uh, the Upanishads were a more philosophical text that um, evolved around the 8th to 6th centuries BCE. And then the Bhagavad Gita is probably the most popular text within uh, Hinduism. And that's the story about Krishna and Arjuna. Uh, and it's, it's a story about Arjuna's devotion to God, uh, Krishna. As far as the major teaching in Hinduism, again, we talked about that what characterizes Hinduism is a lot of diversity. But two things that you can find, I think, in some way threaded throughout Hinduism are the concepts of karma and reincarnation. And so review that you know what those terms are about. As far as names for God or the God concept in uh, Hinduism, you might review again in the notes where I talked about that there is no universal God concept 
in Hinduism, that you'll find some Hindus that are polytheistic, some who appear to be monotheistic, some who might appear to be atheistic even because gods don't seem to even figure in to their practice. Uh, but a few things that you might note on this chart is that uh, when people talk about the deities within Hinduism, a number that they use is 330 million gods and goddesses. Some of the most famous of those deities include Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And again, those are the three that, that maintain this continuous cycle of rebirth. Brahma as creator, Vishnu as maintainer or sustainer of life, and then Shiva as the destroyer, which Brahma then recreates from. And then the other was Krishna, uh, the god that you find in the Bhagavad Gita. Also, um, the god in Hinduism that was believed to have been an incarnation of Vishnu, that sustainer god. Um, as far as divisions within Hinduism, there are not neat and tidy divisions. There are many groups within Hinduism. There are not really denominations. But three uh, kind of what I talked with you about were tendencies or strains that you find within Hinduism would include the path of ritual action, the path of knowledge, and the path of devotion. And in your notes, you should have a little chart that gives more distinctive information about each of those that would be good for you to review. One piece of distinctive in information from that chart is about the goals of each of those paths. Uh, for instance, for the path of ritual action, the highest goal that is believed to be achieved by most people in that sort of tendency of Hinduism is that your highest goal is reincarnation into a higher caste level. That's the best you can hope for. The path of knowledge, uh, the goal is moksha, or finding release from that cycle of reincarnation. And then the path of devotion, the goal, is to, um, in the next life, to be united with the god or the goddess to which you've been devoted satisfactorily throughout your life. And again, that's the path that sounds a little bit more like a Judeo-Christian understanding of the next life, that if you live out this life devoted enough to God, then you spend eternity with that God. And that, that's the essence of the path of devotion. Now, if, if you can go through and talk about these basics of Hinduism um, with at least as much information as what I've just done, you have a really good foundation on the information on Hinduism that you need to know. Again, your, your notes will put some more flesh on that. Uh, your terms list will put some more flesh on that. Your film study guides will put some more flesh on that um, over the film that you watched over Hinduism. And then also the readings and the material from the readings that you were asked to, uh, to retain from the reading. So that's Hinduism. The second religion then is Buddhism. As far as when Buddhism began, uh, it would have, you would say the 6th century BCE because that would have been the time frame of the life of the Buddha, the founder of Buddhism. Uh, his name, uh, the founder, was Siddhartha, as you may recall, uh, actually raised Hindu and then out of uh, really kind of a disillusionment with Hinduism's ability to deal with suffering in life and also uh, Hinduism, especially ritual Hinduism's inability to offer escape from repeated experiences of suffering in life through reincarnation, uh, the Buddha left and began this path to try to find a way to escape this repeat, these successive lives of suffering. And so Siddhartha was the founder in the 6th century BCE. Uh, the sacred text of Buddhism, uh, again, like with Hinduism, there's not a Bible in uh, Buddhism. And even though there are many writings in Buddhism, uh, not, there's not really any universal or even semi-universal sacred text. The text that I did mention to you is a collection called the Dhammapada. And what's significant about that is that that's the earliest written collection of the teachings of the Buddha. It was not written during the lifetime of the Buddha. Uh, his teachings were passed down by oral tradition for about 125 years, and then 125, 150 years after his death, uh, this collection was written of this, this oral tradition, and that collection is called the Dhammapada. The core teachings of Buddhism are the Four Noble Truths and then the Eightfold Path. Um, it'd probably be good to know the Four Noble Truths, that the problem in life, according to Buddhism, is suffering, and that the path to finding freedom from that suffering is to eliminate desire. Uh, and then the second set of teachings is the Eightfold Path. The, uh, as far as for the test, I don't know that you need to worry about being able to 
you know, tick off the eight parts of that path, but just have the general essence that it's, um, it's a path through which one finds escape from desire and ultimately suffering. But I don't know that you need to worry about memorizing the specifics of the path. As far as deity, uh, the God concept in uh, Buddhism, what you find is that in pure traditional Buddhism, there is no God concept. It's, it's not about deities. It's not about worship of deities at all in, in pure traditional Buddhism. So no God in Buddhism in its purest form. The two major divisions that I talked to you about uh, in class and that your text uh, particularly distinguishes are Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism. Um, probably the significant difference between the two is that Mahayana is a more group-oriented, uh, there's a lot of help on the spiritual path. It's the big boat uh, on which people can ride to find this freedom from suffering. Whereas Theravada Buddhism is much more individually oriented. Uh, there's not re you don't really seek help from others and you don't seek help from a spiritual realm for spiritual guidance. You're very much on your own and so it's a little boat. And you know, as we talked about the nickname for that, kind of in um, opposite of Mahayana is Hinayana, the little boat or the little raft. The goal of the Buddhist is to achieve nirvana. And uh, again, probably the clearest definition we can give in nirvana is that it's uh, the elimination of desire and thus the elimination of suffering. And as we talked about, nirvana basically means to extinguish. This is the idea of extinguishing desire and suffering. Um, something else that you might take note of um, on this, this chart is also what the human problem is of each religion. You know, with Hinduism, the human problem is samsara, that people are continually caught in the cycle of reincarnation. Uh, whereas with Buddhism, the human problem is suffering. And, and one aspect of that suffering is samsara, because you have to be reborn into lives of suffering. Um, but those would be the human problems on those two paths. As far as Judaism, um, where we would connect its origin and history would be about 4,000 years ago. Um, Abraham, it seems, probably made that migration um, from Mesopotamia into what, uh, into what was called Canaan then, Palestine today, um, around the 18th century BCE. And so the founder of Judaism is considered uh, to be Abraham because of that. The sacred text of Judaism is the Torah, uh, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Now again, it's probably important to make sure we understand that there is a Bible in uh, Judaism, and that, that collection of texts is equivalent to the Old Testament, as Christians call it. But then the first five books of the Hebrew Bible uh, is the Torah, and those are considered the most sacred of the texts of Judaism. Another text that I talked with you about when we covered Judaism was the Talmud. And the Talmud is that collection of originally oral tradition that eventually was written. And it's a collection that explains, interprets, elaborates on the laws of the Torah. The major teaching of Judaism uh, would be the laws of the Torah, um, 613 of those, as many Jewish teachers say. But the core of those is, is what we would call the Ten Commandments. And, you know, I think of the Ten Commandments as like sort of the preamble to the rest of those laws. Uh, in many ways, the rest of the laws add flesh to those Ten Core Commandments. And those Ten Commandments are about how to relate to God in a covenant relationship with Him. That's the first four of the commands. And about how to relate to people. Uh, which is another part of the covenant aspect of Judaism, and that's the last six of the commands. Uh, God is called by many different names in Judaism, but Yahweh is the personal name for God, or Jehovah. Uh, we talked about three major divisions within Judaism, although there are many groups within Judaism, but the three major groups are Orthodox, which is the most conservative, uh, then Conservative, which is the more middle-of-the-road path, and then Reform, which is the most liberal. And you might review some of the distinctions that I talked about with those in your class notes. As far as the goals of Judaism, uh, there, there's a couple that I guess I want to emphasize because of what we talked about in the material in this class. Of course, the first overarching goal in Judaism is the coming of a Messiah. 
And there's differences in belief about whether that's actually a, a person that will come. More Orthodox Jews would tend to believe that. Or whether that's more of an era of time that might be kind of symbolized by a person. So what's often called the Messianic era. And some of the more liberal groups of Jews would tend to believe that's what we're talking about more with the idea of the Messiah. But regardless, there's an idea that there will come a time, a Messianic era, in which there'll be peace on earth um, and the Jews' relationship with God will be established and proven and, and shown to be true. So that's the primary goal, is the coming of the Messiah or Messianic era. Another goal that we talked about that some Jews have is uh, the full establishment of Israel as outlined in the biblical text as, as, a, as its own country, as its own state. There is a state of Israel but it does not fully encompass, and certainly that changes all the time because of uh, the skirmishes that we have in the Middle East, but um, it's the full establishment of that land that's according to God's will as outlined in the Bible. And the movement, the political movement, that uh, has worked toward that historically is a movement called the Zionist movement, one, one of your terms. For Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, the human problem is sin. Uh, behavior or lack of certain behaviors that separate people from God. So as far as the human problem, you could just distinguish sin for all three of these monotheistic faiths. Uh, for Christianity, uh, Christianity began in the first century CE, and the founder, um, even though there's, there's various perspectives on who really started this movement, Traditionally, the founder is believed to be Jesus, although, as we talked about earlier in this class, he was, he was, not, he was Jewish. Uh, by, by name or by denominational name, Jesus was not Christian. There were not Christians by name until sometime after the life of Jesus. Uh, but certainly, without him, you wouldn't have the Christian movement. So, um, so for our purposes, we'll, we'll say that Jesus is the founder, in fact, of Christianity. The sacred text of Judaism is the Bible that contains the Old Testament, again, equivalent to the Hebrew Bible that the Jews have, plus the New Testament. And within the New Testament, uh, there's a particular set of writings, the first four books of the New Testament, called the Gospels, which are the interpretations of Jesus' life. And then the rest of the New Testament is really kind of interpretations of Jesus' teaching and the basic doctrine of the early Christian movement. Um, the major teaching of Christianity, uh, the topic that was the focus of Jesus' teaching was the kingdom of God. And uh, again, as you should have in your notes, that's not just about something future, but it's the idea that it's the establishment of the rule of God everywhere. And so it's, it's about how to live under God's rule, uh, submitted to God in this life, in community life, as well as in the future, and as typically heaven is also called the kingdom of God. The name for God in Christianity is God, um, or Father might be distinguished, uh, because as Jesus led the way in that. Uh, the three major groups within Christianity are Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and Protestant. And so you probably want to review your notes on the history of Christianity as far as uh, when and why the Orthodox and Catholics split in the 11th century, and then um, the issues of the Protestant movement or Protestant Reformation that split off from the Catholic Church in the 16th century. Uh, but those would be your three big umbrellas within Christianity. And as far as the goal of Christianity, um, as far as anything that we talked about, you could just put heaven, that there's some sort of future kingdom that all people will reside in with God. Finally, Islam uh, began in the 7th century CE, particularly the year that's considered the founding year of Islam is 622, and that was, that was when the Hejra occurred, when Muhammad and his uh, few converts, mostly close friends and family, fled Mecca and moved to Medina, and uh, that move is considered kind of the, the thing that spawned the beginning of Islam in 622 as it moved to Medina. The founder of Islam is Muhammad. Uh, the sacred text of Islam is the Quran. The, ba the basic teaching of Islam would be the five pillars of Islam. And you might review what those five pillars are and uh, the basic idea of each of those pillars. 
uh, what, you know, what does the creed say? Uh, how many times do they pray? When do they fast? Uh, what's the significance of the Hajj or the pilgrimage? Um, so just kind of reviewing the basics of each of those as we covered them in class and as your text talks about them. God in Arabic, Arabic is the language of Islam. Uh, God is uh, Allah in Islam. The three major divisions that you have within Islam are the Sunnis, the Shia or Shiites, and the Sufis. The Sunnis being by far the largest, um, the Sufis being the smallest, the more mystical sect. And so, again, review basic characteristics of each of those groups. And then the goal of um, Muslims is to attain paradise, an eternal home with God and with his angels. And, um, and that's, that's the whirlwind tour, the basics of these religions that, again, you have a lot more information. But if you get this stuff down and know what these terms mean, then as you go back and start reviewing your notes, terms lists, study guides, um, all that's going to come pretty quick because you've got these basics down. Um, so study well.